Hello everyone, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and one of the recurring questions I get here on the channel is why did Germany not develop and use a large force of long-range four-engine bombers during World War II? And in fact this is quite a contentious question it seems because every time it pops up arguments ensue. And for such a simple question really the answer is indeed quite complicated and today I'm going to lay out to you an answer in an attempt to explain why Germany didn't in fact have that force of long-range strategic bombers at the start of the war. Without of course considering this video to be any sort of end of the discussion. And the reason for that is simple. It's because that, well the reasons as you will see are complex and there are in fact some contradictions. And now I recognize that in the first part of this video I'll be touching upon a lot of theory and doctrine, aspects that often seem so abstract that they couldn't really possibly have any sort of importance on a discussion uh, about things like military equipment. But if there ever was a case that the connection between theory, doctrine, and practical decisions in development of weapons cannot be ignored, well, then that example is probably the Luftwaffe. One of the advantages enjoyed by the Reichsschadow Luftwaffe was the close and effective cooperation between those who developed doctrine for the aerial war, the army and the defense ministry staff who made the military plans with the greater strategic context, with those who developed and built weapons and prototypes in the weapons office, and finally the actual producers of the weaponry. We start this off with the immediate post-World War I world. You're familiar with it, of course. This is just going to be a flyby. In the Treaty of Versailles, Articles 198 to 202 and 313 to 320 severely restricted Germany's aeronautical industry. But the Treaty of Versailles and the amendments and agreements that followed in the 1920s, early 1920s, were actually those that really handicapped Germany's aeronautical society and of course its industry in the long run. Uh, for example, in 1922, Germany was officially forbidden to have any of the following. Single-seaters with engine ratings above 60 horsepower. Aircraft with armor, defensive capabilities, or those that allow for the installation of weaponry. Engines that permit over compression. Aircraft able to pass 4,000 meters in altitude. Able to fly faster than 170 kilometers an hour at 2,000 meters of altitude. With a fuel load exceeding a volume of 0.8 times 177 kilograms per horsepower. Any aircraft able to reach the above performance limits and still able to carry a load of 600 kilograms. No engines could be exported or stockpiled. These restrictions were of course severe and they were kept until 1926 when some of them were lifted but only for civilian aviation although no public money could be used for this either. It all had to be sourced from private investors and military aircraft remained an absolute no-go. And this, of course, handicapped Germany's aeronautical uh, society and the developments that came out of it. Now, granted, Germany set up covert aviation agencies. They sent designers and companies abroad, and they cooperated with various nations out there on aeronautical matters like the Soviet Union or Japan. But the volume of work does not compare at all to that in Britain, the United States, the Soviet Union, or France. But nevertheless, the 1920s saw a lot of developments that are really of crucial importance here. The 1920s were a time of theoretical discussions and clandestine planning under Hans von Seegt. For now, Germany planned to have an air force centered around cheap one-engine machines as fighters, but actually primarily as reconnaissance tools for the army. Not that Germany actually had an air force, so that was just a plan. By the mid-20s then, Germany got more concrete in terms of theory and doctrine. One of the documents published around 1925 provides a glimpse of where Reichswehr air doctrine stood seven years after the end of the war. This 1925 pamphlet discussed air power at the operational level and specified that, in wartime, there would be essentially two air forces. One allocated to army control for air support of the divisions, corps 
and armies, and the other, the aerial fighting forces consisting of the fighters and bombers. Germany was very much aware and informed of the different trends out there, the discussion between the Duhetians and Mekotians in Italy, the Trinchardians and the Slesserites in the United Kingdom, and of course of that highly public clash between Billy Mitchell and the United States Navy. On the whole, however, looking at these discussions and thinking for themselves, German theories, well, they never fully bought this whole the bomber will always get through story. But at the same time, it did have supporters of strategic warfare, which is sometimes forgotten. For example, in 1924, a book by Kapitän Hans Ritter argued that a modern war was an economic war and that the enemy's homeland was a stockpile just waiting to be destroyed. But instead of an offensive doctrine using strategic bombers, Germany could not build in the first place. Well, such concerns um, kind of prompted a comprehensive and unprecedented air defense program, which must also have influenced the opinion that, in fact, the bomber will not, in fact, always get through, and when it does, its impact will not always be as such as some people claim it would be. The primary question, however, was not whether Germany would experience strategic bombing in the next war, but the degree to which Germany was vulnerable to strategic bombing. One positive aspect of Germany's lack of an air force in the 1920s was to push German military personnel and civilians to seriously consider how one might conduct a passive defense. What does this have to do with Germany's own development of four-engine bombers? Well, since you asked, this helplessness made Germany think more in terms of how an enemy air force could be quickly destroyed rather than how an air force would dominate the battlefield simply by virtue of showing up. For example, the difficult relationship that uh, Germany has with France in the 1920s and of course the 1940s and actually it didn't get much better after that either, but it was one of the reasons why the Luftwaffe became what it was. In the mid to late 20s, the French Aviation Militaire was without doubt the most powerful air arm in the world. Clearly, a conventional class with the Aviation Militaire was unthinkable, even in the medium term. Germany therefore advocated an interdiction campaign that would seek to destroy the sources of its military power, its key aircraft and armament factories. Such thinking became the basis for the 1926 directives a 39-page document that laid out a proposed organization targeting strategy and operational parameters for a bombing campaign, a concept that was referred to as Operativa Luftkrieg, Operational Air War. Sure enough, it's 1926 now, and Germany still has a long way to go, but this was the first directive that condensed that new but reminiscent of the old German way of thinking when it comes to warfare into a sort of a clear framework that would go all the way into influencing the later Luftwaffe. And then in 1927, the Heereswaffenamt set the technical specifications for a four-engine night bomber known as Grönabo. That's short for Großnachtbomber, large night bomber. Although the industry answered with designs, this development had no relevance to the actual realities in which the Reichswehr found itself around 1930, as planning by the Reichswehr only foresaw the use of twin-engine designs for night bombing, and even this only after long indecision by the army leadership. This indecision on the German side is understandable. German officers remembered the bombing both day and night, and both conducted by themselves and sustained during the previous World War. And they analyzed this damage and this bombing campaign a lot more soberly than the strategic bomber supporters abroad. The Allied bombing campaign against Germany was less successful than the German campaign against England in terms of costs and benefits. Although the Allied effort was far greater, the casualties and damage inflicted was less. The German air staff studied the effect of the Allied strategic raids against Germany and concluded that they posed no major threat to the population or to war production. The Germans were, quite rightly, not impressed with the Allied strategic bombing campaign. Their experience with World War I and their 1920s observations gave the Germans two convictions when it came to bombers. First, 
bombers were not invulnerable. And second, qualitative and or quantitative superiority did not guarantee effective damage. You have to hit the key areas to deliver concrete results. And if you are of course familiar with sort of the German military thinking since at least, well you might as well go back to Frederick the Great, the concentration of power, rapid movement, setting a Schwerpunkt, yeah, a main point or a main area for the main effort, you can start seeing those wheels turning inside the heads of the theorists back then. These observations were confronted with practical realities, of course, as Germany was lacking in technical know-how, industrial capacity, and also facilities. By 1933, the German aviation industry had, while being more or less reliant on governmental support, already developed a plethora of aircraft types for the secret Reichswehrfliegerei, yet could not expand beyond the capacity of 3,500 workers due to a chronic lack of orders. By the way, all of this happened before the Nazis took power. Then, in 1933, when the Nazis take over, the Reichsluftfahrtsministerium, the Reichsair Ministry, was founded and various uh, technical bureaus uh, and uh, cabinets provided an increasing centralized control and governmental support for a growing industry. Uh, but let's face it, there was still a noticeable delay since neither the industry nor the men, nor the machines could simply be made available overnight. This was especially true for bombers. In 1933 it was not possible to set up an operational bomber unit because neither the material nor the personnel was available. In October 1933 a so-called Behelfsbombergeschwader was set up, whereby the Deutsche Lufthansa provided the aircraft, men and technical facilities if a need arose. Germany's bomber force thus was one written on paper only at the beginning. Germany possessed only around 550 trained aviators, of which about 100 were classified as fighter pilots. And only the commercial airlines had the pilots capable of flying complex multi-engine machines, hence their importance during this time and hence why you always hear about Germany using civilian pilots initially. The early program to field 1,000 aircraft, already in planning before the Nazis, I might add, only foresaw around 370 bombers. Reality was that Germany is focused on building up the force quickly, quantity before quality, with the majority of the machines being, well, trainer aircraft and fighters and reconnaissance machines. Nevertheless, Germany started the year of 1934 with only 30 bombers, Yet it ended it with 80 Dornier Do 11 bombers and about 200 Junker Ju-52 auxiliary bombers. Both the leadership and the technical office knew that these bombers, including the military version of the Ju-52, did not meet the requirements. But the qualitative inadequacy of the equipment had to be accepted until the current development and testing of superior models was completed. Given these limitations, plans were put into motion to develop more competitive machines that are more telling of the time. But before you can do that, you of course need to know what sort of aircraft you actually need and against what enemy. France and Poland were considered the main potential adversaries, with Belgium and Czechoslovakia taking a secondary position. There is no proof that, between the years 1933 and 1935, either the United Kingdom or the Soviet Union were considered by the military leadership as belligerents. A large-scale air war over sea and land were as of yet not included in the military planning of this time. I know that it might sound strange that the Soviet Union is not seen as an enemy at this point. You have to see this from well, the German perspective in 1934. It didn't even have the means to defend itself from smaller neighbors. Uh, so whatever they might have planned for you know, the, the long term, for the, for the future, doesn't really matter for now. This is also true for the whole four-engine bomber uh, program that is running at this point. The program to build up and enlarge the Luftwaffe can only be understood if one recognizes the perspectives of the time, which did not consider an aerial offensive against the United Kingdom nor a military clash with the Soviet Union. The 1934 non-aggression treaty between Germany and Poland 
provided some relief of the threat of a preemptive two-front war uh, against the Reich from both east and west. But it did not change the uh, regional conception of German military planning, which remained and was by necessity still defensively orientated. But yes, it becomes increasingly offensively minded as capabilities increased and that offense became a possible reality. As the force built itself up, slowly at first, war games continue to experiment with practical application of the new aircraft that Germany was developed. With the strengthening of Germany's aeronautical industries, its uh, capacities and capabilities, support for a bomber fleet started to grow. To give you an idea of how the capacities grew, here is actually a graph that shows you the number of workers Germany as industry employed from 1933 to 1938. In about five years, the size of the industry grows by a factor of 50. With the growing capabilities, the development of bombers became possible. Walter Weber usually stands at the center of this debate, and often he is sort of seen as the German version of Mitchell or Trenchard. This is not the case at all. Weber did call the bomber the decisive factor in aerial warfare, but, and this is important, this needs to be placed within context of his operational thinking. At no time did Weber express any especially radical views on air power. Weber easily rejected many of Duhay's propositions concerning strategic bombing, instead developing his own theories. Let's say you are looking for the German Duhay or the German Trenchard. Then you won't find him in Walter Weber, but you will find him, perhaps, in Robert Knaus. He believed Germany needed to invest in nothing more than a large bomber force, since this, and this only, would provide deterrence at a bargain price. And yes, he even felt that indiscriminate bombing was acceptable. But his convictions, this must be said as well, were not without criticism. Knaus suggested the speedy and covert development of an air fleet of approximately 394 engine bombers which would be reinforced by 10 air reconnaissance staffeln. Knaus was convinced that such an extremely mobile military instrument on the side of Germany would yield decisive advantages in a two-front war with France and Poland, but he specifically calculated on the deterrent effect. Compared to Weber, Knaus never had the same influence and the real planning in building up the force did, well, did not follow his line of thinking. This program, slightly adjusted in August and September 1933, barely resembled Knauss' expectation because the air fleet was neither composed out of the expected heavily armed bombers, nor was his numerical recommendation of bombers reached. However, it must be recognized that the program followed the basic idea. The Bombergeschwader would be the core of the future air force and take on both the political and military deterrence value that Knauss had anticipated. Voices like Wilhelm Wimmer, Hemo Felmi, Hemo Wilberg became influential. Together, Weber, Wimmer, and Wilberg started to codify the Luftwaffe's envisioned operational conduct and they placed an emphasis not on strategic bombing but various other tasks. This did not question the necessity of direct support for the Army and Navy but was of the opinion that the Air Nemes Air Force had to be destroyed first before any direct or indirect support of the other two forces could be given. Regaining control of the air by defeating the enemy's air force was the primary objective. Weber argued that the best defense against enemy air power was to go on the offense. It is not possible to create an unlimited number of areas adequately defended against air attack and at the same time build up a strong air force. Instead, the evil should be attacked at its roots. The enemy bomber formations should be caught at the most vulnerable moment, when they are on the ground. By destroying the enemy's aircraft in combat and on the ground, the Luftwaffe would have free reign over the field. This line of thinking is enshrined in Luftwaffendienstvorschrift 16, which is perhaps, well, it, yeah, you could actually say that perhaps it's the most important document the Luftwaffe has ever published because it explains how the Luftwaffe itself plans to conduct its operations. 
and it was released in 1935 and it saw no major revision save for let's say a few annotations until 1945. The parameters of warfare presented in LDV-16 was in its aim completely conventional. Only the manner and methods were new, but not revolutionary since it rested on a development from the 1914 to 1918 experience combined with new technological capabilities. Right at the start of the war the destruction of the enemy's air force was envisioned and through continuous bombing of known pre-war bases, ground operations as well as communication centers the enemy's air threat was to be eliminated in an offensive. Just so you know, in this quote I translated the German Friedensstandorte to known pre-war bases, which captures the idea of the original, which would be peace locations in literal translation. In the following years the cooperation with the army was emphasized, but if you look for example at the Luftwaffe operations, well, let's go through them, right? Against Poland, the Low Countries, France, even Britain, and then of course the Soviet Union, a pattern repeats itself and that is that the Luftwaffe seeks to destroy the enemy's air force and after that it supports the army and only then it goes after the industry and the stockpiles if necessary. The fact that Germany was a continental power certainly also has an influence or at least it contributed to their opinion that direct support of the army was probably more relevant than long strike potential. LDV-16 argued that actions against the enemy's war industry and their supply infrastructure to the front lines could drastically influence the outcome of the war in itself, but the resulting impact on the actual fighting by both Heer and Kriegsmarine would be delayed for too long and would bind Luftwaffe forces at the same time. In the mid-1930s, twin-engine machines fitted the conception of the regional war Germany was anticipating with its direct neighbors and of course its envisioned conduct of air operations. Four-engine machines? Well, they didn't and they couldn't. They were expensive, they were complex and ongoing issues with engine performance and engine production as well as aircraft production made development difficult. Although, of course, it was pushed forward to some degree. Nowadays, some people call it the Oral Bomber Project. It has as of yet not been confirmed with written documents that the Air Ministry used the term Oral Bomber throughout the development of a four-engine bomber. Naturally, this designation might have been used in conversation, but only in the sense of its eventual range and not in regards to its strategic use in a possible German-Soviet war. The Ural bomber was a terminus technicus. It did not hold significance in the operational conceptions of the time. In 1946, due to the limitations of engine technology, it became the policy of the Luftwaffe air staff to simply skip the entire first generation of bombers and begin research and development of a future heavy bomber, which would be deployed when the German aircraft industry and aircrew training had caught up technologically. When it comes down to it, Germany followed a logic of a relatively functional weapon you can actually build is better than no weapon at all. And it shelved ambitious projects. This is where the later long range bomber aircraft like the four engine Heinkel HE-177 find their origin. And yes, I know the HE-177 looks like it is a two engine machine, but each prop is driven by two engines, so that makes four. Heinkel was instructed to continue a study into four-engine bombers without a given deadline or production being prepared. By the mid-1930s, Germany still had no proper bomber project and had to completely reset their bomber development. And it was starting to push forward the introduction of conventional machines until technological progress and uh, industrial capacities, as well as the logistical infrastructure within Germany, enabled the production of machines that met sort of the set requirements that people would anticipate for engine bomber machines to have. The German political and military leadership believed until 1938 that it could manage with a Luftwaffe that would, equipped with large numbers of medium and dive bombers, engage on its own both the air power and war industry of potential central European belligerents, as well as being able to support the operations of the Heer at the same time. There was that continental aspect again. 
Even by 1939, though it had four engine machines like the Fokker Wolf FW200, which really can't be classified as a heavy bomber, Germany recognized the advantages of the heavy bomber as a concept, but also their price. Let's, for example, have a look here at what a standardized German production, sorry, not production, publication from 1939 has to say on the subject of heavy bombers. With the heavy bomber, the additional bomb load requires additional engine power and a corresponding increase in the size of the aircraft. The reduced speed requires additional defensive measures. It needs large airfields, the strong defensive weaponry limits the bomb load, the size limits maneuverability and enlarges the target area. Adding to this comes the necessary supply of spare parts, which provides incredible difficulties for larger units. Ground-based defenses force the bomber to ever higher altitudes and due to this, the accuracy of its dropped bombs in horizontal flight can be questioned. During attacks on small and moving targets, the chances for hits are reduced considerably. I find this text quite telling, since with its criticism, it shows you where the Germans place their emphasis for bombers. And that would be speed, operational mobility, tactical versatility, logistical sufficiency, and accuracy. By this point in time, then, the first signs of change, of course, emerged. Germany now possessed the potential, in pure industrial terms, to build a force of long-range bombers. In 1938, one year before the war starts, a first step starts being taken. In a memorandum, Helmut Felmy, you might remember him from earlier, a supporter of long-range bombing as well, argued that a war with Great Britain might be problematic due to the limited range of the existing fleet. The range of bomber units without bases in Belgium and the Netherlands was not sufficient to allow successful operations against the island and the training of the crews was not sufficient to allow for an air war over water. Goering thus ordered the completion of the Ju-88 as a priority in the long term, the four-engined HE-177 was envisioned. But now we are in 1939. The war kicks off and Germany has no expensive and resource-intensive long-range bomber in the conventional sense. The Fokker Wolf 200 does not count, but yes, that video is coming. I just need you guys to have a little bit more patience. It serves as a reminder at this point that Germany isn't that different to other countries like the United States, like the Soviet Union, France or even Britain at this point, since most of them only have a small fleet of modern four-engine bombers at this point in 1949. The US, of course, has the B-17, but not that many, and it's not the fortress you know from the war, it's still an earlier machine. Britain introduces the Hanley Page Halifax in 1949, but it won't have the more famous Avro Lancaster until 1941. The difference is that Germany, for the reasons I have laid out, only starts to turn to this concept now, slowly, with a whole lot of upcoming problems and it has no design ready for production. The development of the Heinkel HE-177 will continue. That's a whole other video I will have to make at some point, I guess, and that's gonna be fun. And yes, of course, America Bomber. But that Luftwaffe fantasy never got off the ground. I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed the video. I hope that you found it informative. And remember that military aviation history is what you could call an independent organization. So consider supporting via Patreon or channel memberships to make this sort of content possible. This is especially true so for these longer format videos that take a lot of time and research to complete. And big thank you here, of course, already to those existing Patreons and channel supporters for making this sort of content possible. Now, if you cannot support, don't worry, I understand. Please consider sharing the video, telling others about the channel, and of course, subscribing for more. Also, a big thank you here to Andrew and Military History Visualized for their feedback on the script. And as always, I wish all of you a great day and see you in the sky.